Welcome to the Savvy Woman Proactive Education Series. I'm Catherine Magana, a certified financial planner with Savvy Woman Wealth Management, where we provide financial education for women. At Savvy Woman Wealth Management, we provide live workshops, webinars, and online videos to help our clients learn about all different types of financial related topics. We've also heard from you who asked us to go a little deeper on some different financial topics such as asset management, liability management, protective strategies, and estate planning. And today we have a special guest with us that's gonna to talk, to talk to you about tax planning. Tax planning and financial planning go hand in hand. We think it's really important to have a tax strategy and plan in place when you're looking at your overall financial planning goals. And so we work with tax advisors, similar to somebody we have here with us today. And we're really pleased to have with us Rachel Ivanovich from Easy Life Management. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Catherine. It's great to be here. Yeah, so we're um, happy to have a conversation and learn a little bit more about some things that you think investors would be open to learning about. And so we'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes. So so today we're really going to talk about um, what's new with capital gains and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We're talk going to talk a little bit about tax harvesting, um, how tax loss harvesting can help you when planning for Roth conversions. We're going to talk about Roth conversions, the net investment income tax, a very exciting subject, and how to avoid underpayment penalties. Great. So I guess let's start with the capital gains. I mean, what would what do you have to share with us? Yeah, a lot of people asked after, as the new tax code came, mm -hmm. and we got a lot of phone calls um, last December, actually two Decembers ago when they changed the tax code. Yes. And they, everyone wanted to know, okay, how is this going to affect me? And so um, in terms of capital gains, not a lot changed with the capital gains. Mm -hmm. However, um, instead of the capital gains tax being tied to someone's tax bracket, mm -hmm. um, it's now taxed to what their income level is. So that changed a little bit. Um, it's important to plan for this because... Mm -hmm. Um, the three rates that were in effect beforehand, the 0%, mm -hmm. the 15%, and 20%, the levels change when you hit those three levels. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to really plan ahead to know mm -hmm. where you are with that as you're planning um, for different events that yes. have to do with capital gains. And yes, taxes are important. Unfortunately, when you make money yes. on your investments, uh -huh. you have to pay taxes, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and that's why it's important to do proactive tax planning. Yes. Um, that's basically using the tax code legally to reduce your taxes. Great. Yeah. So what about those losses? Like what about people that are maybe have some losses that they have? Right. So it's important to really understand the difference um, between different sorts of income. So not all income is created equal. Mm -hmm. So if you're a wage earner, you have a job, you get a W-2, that income is called ordinary income. Yep. And if you have investments, investments are taxed differently. So if you have interest income, that's taxed as ordinary income, same as your wages. So you pay whatever your tax bracket is on that. Um, if you have income that qualifies for preferential treatment, mm -hmm. which would be qualified dividends or um, long-term capital gains, those are taxed at those lower rates that I mentioned before, the 0%, the 15%, or the 20%. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to work with your financial advisor mm -hmm. to make sure that you are holding investments long enough so they do qualify for this preferential treatment. Um, so there's a difference. Capital assets are basically your um, your investments that you hold that are your stocks, your mutual funds, mm -hmm. um, and so on, mm -hmm. that if you buy them at one price and you sell them at another, it's either a loss or a gain when you sell it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to know the difference between long-term and short-term. Mm -hmm. So during the year and during over the years, you have to count how long you've held these assets because if you ho hold them for less than a year, you'll be taxed at the higher rates, your, mm -hmm. your tax bracket, versus mm -hmm. if you hold the investment for a year and a day, you'll qualify for the lower or preferential treatment. And that's definitely something you want to pay attention to yeah, and make absolutely. sure that there's ways to... And, and there's ways to, to use those um, losses and mm -hmm. those gains because technically short-terms and long-term are grouped are, and tracked separately. Mm -hmm. So anything that you've held for a year or less is, mm -hmm. is short-term. Anything you've held for a year and a day is long-term. But then, it, then they get combined. Mm -hmm. And so that's important to know. So, that's, so for instance, maybe you have a year where your income's down. Mm -hmm. Maybe you are changing jobs. Maybe mm -hmm. you got laid off. Um, things happen in, in your life, and your income levels go up and down. Mm -hmm. So then if your income is lower, you talk to your financial advisor. You'd mm -hmm. want to sell off assets that have appreciated and mm -hmm. have gains so that maybe you're in that lower or even 0% mm -hmm. bracket. So if you're married, about up to $77,000. Mm -hmm. Um, you can sell long-term capital assets and qualify for that 0% rate. Nice. And then that ties in as to the tax loss harvesting and what people look at usually. Exactly. Usually at the end of the year, I kind of, you, people tend to look at right. that. Right. And that's a yeah. great strategy to yes. use. So if you don't know what tax loss harvesting is, it's a really great tool that, that you can use mm -hmm. if you have 
um, already sold off some stocks or have mutual fund cap gain distributions, um, mm -hmm. and you have those gains, you want to look to your portfolio, talk to your financial advisor, mm -hmm. and really see what other um, assets that you have that are considered unrealized. So mm -hmm. unrealized means you haven't sold them yet. Maybe they're down, mm -hmm. but you can then sell them to offset those gains mm -hmm. that you've already have in your portfolio. And it's interesting because sometimes at the end of the year, you also look at if everything's up and you really do have to sometimes search for those Losses, those losses and then is it worth you have to look at is it worth it or what's the benefit so exactly. there's some strategy in, in place but right. absolutely it's and, and, and like I mentioned before you really want to look at what your other income is yeah. because if your income's down then yeah. obviously you don't want to sell those losses in that year yeah. you want to realize the gains in the year when your income is down nice so some of the things um, I'm hearing about uh, or talk to a lot of clients about are kind of Roth conversions. Yes. And if, is it something that we should do or not do? And um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that and I can share maybe some things I see out there yeah, with people absolutely. that use that. So Roth conversion. So this is a little bit complicated, but um, just to tie tax loss harvesting in with Roth conversions, mm -hmm. um, when you do a Roth IRA conversion, you have to have the capital, the cash available, the liquidity, mm -hmm. in order to actually pay the taxes mm -hmm. on that. And some people get stuck at the end of the year when they think, oh, I'll do a Roth conversion, but then maybe they don't have the cash to actually cover it. So that's a good time to to look and see, you know, what gains do I have in my portfolio? What losses mm -hmm. do I have? Can I sell off and net that so that we basically have a zero taxable event mm -hmm. um, to use that money to pay for the Roth conversion? So just to clarify, there is a difference between a traditional IRA mm -hmm. and a Roth IRA. So it, it, traditional IRAs are tax deferred investments. Mm -hmm. So when you fund a traditional IRA, you put the money in with after tax dollars. So you get your paycheck, you get the money, you make the contribution, and you make sure you tell your tax advisor, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that you've actually contributed because you do take the tax deduction on your re your tax return for the year that you've made that contribution. Mm -hmm. um, and, and oftentimes what happens is that people want to fund a Roth IRA, which is a tax-free investment. So the money goes in po with post-tax dollars. You don't get the upfront tax benefit. But then later when you take the money out, all of the money is tax-free. So it's really, I think it's a great tool for mm -hmm. investors and for taxpayers to use to grow their money tax-free. So one of the things that I see um, is with those that are kind of in that maybe full retirement age, Social Security to age 70, where there's some maximization where you're, um, if you hold off on taking your Social Security, it can grow. Yes. And in that time period, maybe your income's a little lower, so maybe you do a partial Roth conversion. Correct. So yes. I think that that seems to be like a good time as well. Right. Um, but it's a case by case. It, absolutely. You have to look at the numbers, you have to yes. look at the, the rates and see, does it make sense? Because the idea of it is great, but the, but the, you really have to look at it individually. The, how does the technicality, the how, yeah. how's it going to work, yeah. you know, case by case. Mm -hmm. And so what I see also is oftentimes, like you were saying, is that someone's income could be down and then they could do that conversion. They don't have to convert all of it. Yeah. They can do a portion. Partially. But you do have to keep in mind that when you do a Roth, conversion that mm -hmm. you have to pay the taxes True. on yeah. on the conversion. Yeah. So that's where the tax loss harvesting comes in. Yeah. So that you look to the portfolio and say, okay, maybe I can take you know some losses and some gains and net those and use that cash. Yeah. So it's strategizing. It's, like absolutely. Said, it's, it's the planning part of it. Right. And, and the thing that's mm -hmm. interesting is that if you are a higher in income earner, mm -hmm. you, you may not be able to contribute to a Roth mm -hmm. IRA. So there is a little bit of a planning trick, which you'd want to talk to Catherine about. Mm -hmm. um, so it's called a back backdoor Roth. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that means is you put money into a traditional IRA and maybe your income's too high because mm -hmm. maybe you're married and your spouse has um, a 401k through work, or maybe you have a job and you have a, four, a 401k. So there are limits on these, these different investments, the traditional and the Roth, mm -hmm. um, where with a traditional, the limitations are their income limitations, but they're also deductibility limitations. Mm -hmm. And so there are ways to get around those things with pr proper planning. Mm -hmm. And so if you, let's say your income is too high to deduct that traditional IRA, you mm -hmm. can put it in, it can be a non-deductible mm -hmm. traditional. Mm -hmm. And so you wanna track that, make sure your tax advisor mm -hmm. knows about this because there's a form that has to get filed. Mm -hmm. um, but then you put that in, and then the way to get around being able to contribute to a Roth if your income is too high, mm -hmm. is you take that and then you can convert to traditional to a Roth immediately, mm -hmm. and then you get the tax benefit on that. Which is great, but if you don't convert, then you definitely want to keep track because that yes. later yes. will come back to you. Absolutely. <laughs> well, then you'll end up paying tax twice yeah. on money. Correct. So you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you do tell your tax advisor and B, you tell your financial advisor and you, you track keep all it, of it. Try to keep it separate. Right. Yes. And another point you have to be 
aware of is if you do that backdoor Roth and you have other traditional IRA accounts or a SEP IRA account, which would be a simplified employer pension IRA. So for instance, maybe you were self-employed at one time. You have to look at all of your IRA accounts because it may trigger a taxable event mm -hmm. if you try to do that sort of mm -hmm. um, conversion at that point. Nice. So, well, it's, like I said, there's a lot of different strategies and just figuring out what's yes. best for your Absolutely. Own situation. Absolutely. And Roth is such a great investment, and I, I think that I, I like them. Yeah. It's tax-free. Yeah, Why and not? you don't have to take a required minimum distribution exactly. at age 70 and a half. And you can so. contribute to it indefinitely. Yes. Yeah. So there's Whereas with a traditional IRA, you're cut off at, at a certain point. So, yeah. Okay, um, so tell us a little bit about net investment income tax. Yes, everyone <laughs> loves that. So this, this is a new tax that's out there, and you really do need to watch out for this. So it is a 3.8% additional tax once your income mm -hmm. um, hits a certain um, level. Mm -hmm. So and, and it kind of creates a marriage penalty uh, mm -hmm. in and of itself. So if you are single um, and your income hits $200,000, then you're going to be paying an additional 3.8% on any income that's over that $200,000 mark mm -hmm. or any investment income. So it does require a lot of proper planning. Mm -hmm. Probably could do a whole webinar just, mm -hmm. on, the just, net, on, the <laughs> just on the net investment yeah. income tax. It's probably one of those things that people don't, you don't realize unless you pay attention to. Most people, income, no. you know, now it's they don't. income limits. And so and, I work yeah. with clients to really properly look at because there are ways, because it is the net investment income tax, mm -hmm. because you have to look at what your gross investment income is, and then there are some deductions that reduce that. So, okay. for instance, advisory fees, mm -hmm. um, tax preparation fees, and mm -hmm. so on, which, which are deductions that did get cut from the Tax Cuts mm -hmm. and Jobs Act, but it does, does still reduce oh. your net okay. investment okay. income. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind. But right. it does apply for taxpayers who are over either you know, $200,000 mark or the married filing mm -hmm. joint um, it's 250000 So they only gave $50,000 extra if you are married. You're married, Mom. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was quite a penalty. Okay, and so what about um, avoiding underpayment penalties? What do you, what do you so see So this there? is something that's really important. I think that um, especially newer investors may not be thinking about. Um, and so the IRS, it's a pay-as-you-go as you system. Mm -hmm. The IRS wants their money. And mm -hmm. so if you are an investor, you want to make sure that you're paying proper estimated quarterly payments um, or you're increasing your withholding, mm -hmm. um, which is a great way to do it. But it's important to work with, an, with a tax advisor um, to look at what your safe harbors are. And so the IRS and s different states have safe harbors, which means the IRS wants at least 100% of what you paid in tax mm -hmm. um, from the prior year for you to pay that in during the current year. If your income's over $150,000, they want 110%. Mm -hmm. So you really want to look at, I would say if you have significant investment income, so maybe mm -hmm. anything over $5,000, mm -hmm. you're gonna definitely wanna plan ahead and mm -hmm. say, I'm going to pay in, You know, let's just say you cash out um, you do a Roth conversion, mm -hmm. then you want to say, okay, this is how much the tax that's going to be owed on this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it will save you significant underpayment penalties if you've planned ahead mm -hmm. and you've really looked at making that payment in advance versus mm -hmm. waiting till April 15th to pay in. Yeah. Well, yeah. definitely you don't want to pay extra if you don't have to, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. There's no reason to be paying that. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay. so are there any other things that kind of surface with the new tax law and the um, changes that you want to Tax see? Cuts and Jobs Act. So some <laughs> things really I think are important to think about given that yeah. under the new law um, the standard deduction has increased significantly. And so a lot of people who in, in the past were deducting those advisory fees, mm -hmm. they're no longer deducting those. Mm -hmm. State and local income taxes are capped now at $10,000. Mm -hmm. So instead of people itemizing deductions, um, mm -hmm. a lot of people are falling under the standard deduction. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm finding is that we have a lot of very generous um, clients who, who give you know to various charities mm -hmm. and they still want to be able to maintain that. Mm -hmm. And so what we've come up with are strategies so that they mm -hmm. can still take advantage of that mm -hmm. and even though they're taking the standard deduction. So one of those things that you can do is um, if you are over 70 and a half, mm -hmm. you can take your um, your required minimum distribution from your IRA and you can send that directly to your favorite charity or charities mm -hmm. so that you are still um, getting the advantage of giving to your charity. You may not get it as an itemized deduction, um, but you don't, don't include it in your income, yes. which is so exciting. So it's something uh, that's a lot of, th we've been working on that a lot this last year, okay, um, yeah. the qualified charitable distribution. Yes. So on the when you fill out your form, you mark it, you have Absolutely. the charity and it goes. Or um, charities. Charities, you can do multiple, yeah. but yes, yes. It, um, it's definitely 
definitely something that is being looked at um, this year because I think a lot of people are giving and they're trying to find other ways. Other if ways. I'm already giving. This yes. is a great way to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And and the other thing is is that your social that for social security benefits, if you're mm -hmm. not including that required minimum distribution mm -hmm. in with your taxable income, then mm -hmm. your social not as much as your social security might will be taxable. Okay. So yes. that's something to to think about. Yeah. Um, and then another another strategy. Um, that we have, um, given the, the new Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, is, um, yes, this is a great one. So oftentimes, um, people are giving to charity, mm -hmm. um, but they can look at their stock portfolio mm -hmm. and see what's available that mm -hmm. has appreciated in value. Mm -hmm. And instead of selling that yourself and then giving the money to a charity, you can sell the stock directly, you can give the stock, gift the stock directly, the appreciated stock to your charity, mm -hmm. and you don't pay the, the capital gains mm -hmm. tax, and yeah. the charity gets the full benefit of of the stock that, you, yeah. that, they, that they hold. They can mm -hmm. hold it or they can sell it, but they do actually, they get the full, um, the benefit of that. And you don't include it in income. Yeah. Which, is a which is a bonus, right? Which is a bonus, yeah. <laughs> so. Especially if you're not itemizing anymore. Yeah. You're taking this higher standard deduction. It, I just think it's a really great strategy that a lot of investors um, overlook. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you're trying to be a little more creative now, especially yes. some, of the, the, some of the changes. So. Abso absolutely. Um, so, okay. yeah. Great. Well, thank you. That's definitely insightful. Um, like I said, there's a lot of changes, and it's, everything seems to yes. be constantly changing, <laughs> but uh, it's always good to have strategies in place and look yeah, at it absolutely. year to year. Um, I think for tax planning and financial planning, it, you really have to look at um, all different considerations, yes. income, what other financial goals do you have in place or what are some of the priorities um, and what are ways to be tax efficient and also save. And so there's a lot of different strategies that come into place. So, um, you know, I do appreciate you collaborating yeah. today with us Absolutely. and giving us some tips. And, and, and it's important really to look not only for the short term, but also yeah. really look to the long term. Yeah. Um, because even if you may make a decision that, that benefits you for, for right now, yeah. but for the long term may not work out. So definitely, you know, work with your financial advisor and your tax advisor yeah. to make sure that it makes sense for you. So we believe in creating a personal lifestyle plan. Um, there's not one person that's the same. Everybody's different. They're at a different place in their lives. So um, it's basically customized to you individually. So Rachel, I want you to share with us how people can reach you and contact you. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks, Catherine. You can reach me at rachel at elmtax.com. You can call our office at 760-730-1817. Um, you can find uh, more of our videos at SavvyUp.tv. That's SavvyUp.tv. And we want to thank you for joining us today. Rachel, thank you so much for being a part of this today and educating Absolutely. and helping other women Thanks learn. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, um, and remember, knowledge is power for successful investing. Never stop learning and savvy up.